Hello, Michael here with another RenderMan 22 tutorial. Today we're going to be talking about PXR volumes and how you can use them to create atmosphere and things like that. So I've just got a little scene set up here. It is just a little room with a window with a light coming through it. it looks like that when it's rendered. And we're going to set up some atmosphere inside there so we get a little bit of sort of cast um, light rays coming through there. So uh, what we'll do is we'll create a polygon and we'll just increase the size of that and position it. Okay, so I've created the polygon. I've made it slightly larger than our room for the sake of this tutorial. And what I'm going to do is uh, go into the attribute editor and go down to object display and go to drawing overrides, enable overrides and turn off shading. And that way we can sort of see what's going on uh, inside here and we can still we can actually select the room if we want to. So that's generally something I'd do if I'm using a um, a Pixar volume attached to a, a primitive like that uh, in a scene which I'm working on just makes it easier to handle rather than just chucking it into I mean you could just chuck it into a rent into a layer if you want and lock it but this is quicker obviously so what we're going to do is select our cube I'll just call this Atmo and we'll go over to the render man tab and here we've got create um, PXR volume if you right click on that so you can just click that there and in the hypershade editor you'll get a pixel volume. Now, um, how this will render is like this. So at the moment, the pixel volume is much too um, dense. The first thing we can change here is just to bring down that density. So that's where we want to deal with the density flow. You can actually reduce that quite a lot, something like 0.1. And then you see you start to be able to get a better view of what's actually going on and it's not just obscuring uh, everything uh, because light can't pass through it. So that's you know a pretty good example of sort of your god rays effect and how you might use it. Once you've got objects in the scene however, I'll just put a cube in. Alright so once you've got a um, primitive or any mesh in the scene with it, um, what you'll notice is that the it, it becomes harder to see the um, objects that are inside the atmosphere um, at high density floats. So, you know, at um, 0.5, for example, it's becoming obviously more difficult to see. So you need to balance this out. I know it's it's cool to see the light rays, but um, you also need to consider everything else that's going on in your scene. So a lot of the time you want to use very, very minimal amounts, um, you know, even down as low as 0 0.01, 0 0.05 perhaps. Um, just sort of think about what you're going for here. This is what's called a homogeneous uh, fog or atmosphere, so um, or volume actually. So what that means is there is a constant amount of density within the primitive. Um, if you had something that became more thin towards the top, um, like you could do with a my fluid quite easily, uh, then that would be called a heterogeneous volume. So let's have a look at a couple of our other options. Um, we've already just uh, talked about the density float. So the diffuse color is pretty simple. It's just the color of the volume. So if you render that, that's going to be red. Um, if you were looking to change the color of the fog uh, or of the volume, uh, like say you would see something like in a stained glass window, uh, transmitting light we would see lots of different colored light rays coming through you'd want to do that with the actual lights themselves or you'd want to do it with the refraction through the through the glass pane depending on what is probably going to be easiest for you um, doing it with the lights will probably be a little bit quicker on your render though um, I'd probably comp in the uh, the window pane in that sort of uh, situation but um, if you just want the one color then obviously just the diffuse color Emit color is very simple as well. It just turns it into the uh, volume into a light source. Uh, well, it doesn't quite turn it into light source. It illuminates itself essentially with emit color just turning it up like that. But if you want to turn it into a light source, you actually have to enable it as a light source here. And then it will actually start illuminating the um, scene within itself. Uh, and anything outside of itself as well, like any light source would. However, this is very noisy and very slow to render. So um, consider using a proxy light or something like that. So render out the fog and then, or uh, render out the fog in a separate layer and then render a light in or something like that um, to get a similar effect. Okay, my apologies, uh, my just crashed. So I've just had to rebuild that scene very quickly. 
Um, so everything's reset here, but I'll just quickly render that up so we can see where we're at. All right, so basically back where we were, we've reset the diffuse color and the emit color. Um, so the next thing is multiple scattering. Um, basically, this is going to allow the light to bounce around within the volume a little bit more and you'll get a, re a little bit more realistic effect here. I'll give an example of this a little bit later on at the end of the tutorial when I import an OpenVDB file for you to have a look at using um, the Pixar volume to render it as well. For velocity and velocity multiplier though will only be uh, useful to you if you're reading an OpenVDB that has a speed or a velocity uh, primitive variable in it, um, in which case you'd want to connect that up to here. I'll show you how to connect up primitive variables to uh, things like density and emission um, at the end of the tutorial anyway, so stick around for that. Um, the extinction distance is the distance within the scene that the uh, volume reaches its full opacity, um, so if you're looking into it, how deep you can look into it before you can't see any further. Um, it's measured in scene units and it's a little bit hard to show without rendering up heaps um, to figure out what the actual measurement is, but um, that's a pretty clear explanation, I think. Density primvar, I'll show you how to do that in a second. Uh, density color, uh, essentially this works like, well I'll just show you, um, it sort of works the same as the density float if you are just using um, the alpha values essentially the lower down towards black or a value of zero you go, the less dense it's going to be. Now because it's a um, homogeneous uh, volume you're not going to be able to use something like a ramp to control uh, the density, um, it only works as a constant. Uh, max density is something that we'll work on with OpenVDB. Actually we've probably pretty much covered all the basics there so we'll have a look at OpenVDBs. Um, the only other thing to mention is you have a couple of options here when you actually want to create a pixel volume. You can create a box straight out of in Maya um, or a sphere or a cone. Um, I haven't found a use for the cones but um, sphere you could use for something like atmosphere of a planet. Um, it just makes it a little bit easier to do that sort of thing. Okay, I've just reset the scene slightly and um, we're going to bring in an open VDB. So I'll leave a link in the description on uh, where to get some examples of open VDBs. If you want to create your own, uh, you actually need a plugin for Maya and it is not free. Uh, it is called Soup Open VDB, I believe, uh, or it Bish's Open VDB if it's still using that name from a couple years ago. Um, otherwise, if you were using something like Houdini, you can export them natively and use them in Maya. So for all you Houdini users out there that are doing smoke and uh, cloud effects and that sort of thing, then you're in luck. You can, you can write your open VDBs there, send them over to Maya, and you can read them and render them with RenderMan using this method. So what we do is we right click on the cloud and we create open VDB visualize. What that does in your Hypershade editor is create a new Pixar volume. Um, just at its defaults with nothing plugged into it. And as you can see there's nothing in the scene so what we need to do is select the OpenVDB Visualize in the Attribute Editor. We want to go to the OpenVDB Read and then we're going to go to our file path where there are um, OpenVDB files and I'm just going to open the Bunny Cloud to start with. It's everyone's favorite one after all and I'll just get that light on it. So under the attribute editor, just briefly looking at this, um, you can see what uh, information is carried with the OpenVDB file. Um, a couple of things that you can check here are active bounding boats box is if you've got an animating OpenVDB, uh, which will usually be in a sequence, um, you can have that um, value, uh, the bounding box increase in size as the, say, fire smoke inc uh, increased in uh, its Y value. Uh, the leaf nodes are just those blue um, little voxels. Um, you could activate the voxels rather than using the leaf nodes um, to actually get a better visualization of what that looks like. So you can see there it's a pretty cloudy looking bunny, but um, just for the sake of um, RAM and just you know, visualizing it very quickly, I just usually leave it as is. The other thing you want to look out for is the primitive variables. So these are the things that we can feed into the open uh, into the Pixar volume and control things like the density. So at the moment, it is just going to be a constant. If we render that, it will just take a second. So off the bat, it doesn't look too bad. Um, it does look like a cloudy bunny, uh, but there isn't really a lot of variation in the density there, and we can 
use that density float to control a number of things. Um, so if we jump into here, we could use the density to control the color, for example. So we will run a Pixar ramp and run the RGB into the diffuse color. And then we will say make the uh, densest part red and the least dense part green. That's going to look horrible. And then we'll create a PXR prim var. And in here we need to type in density. As I mentioned before, that's the name of the variable that it will accept. And the variable type is float and that's fine, so leave as is. Then we're going to run the result f into the spline map. And basically that's telling the ramp that um, anything with uh, you know a value of zero is going to or close to zero is going to get a green color and anything that's got a value close to one or it's in highest density is going to get a red color or vice versa I'm not sure which way that's going to render up okay so it's the opposite of what I said um, the denser parts are green and the less dense parts are red um, you could just easily reverse the ramp to get the opposite effect and you can change those colors to whatever so you can see that you uh, are probably thinking oh great you could do some sort of fire effects um, yes, you could. Not with this one though, because it doesn't have um, temperature, or it's, it can be called a bunch of different things. It can be called temperature. It can be called emission. It just depends on um, who made the uh, what what software made the OpenVDB and what its um, default naming convention is. It doesn't really matter what it's called. You just need to uh, be you just need to know what it is and where to put it essentially. So. We'll jump. We'll grab a different OpenVDB. Now, when you do this, you can't just jump in here and read a new file. It tends to make Maya crash, and I've already crashed Maya once tonight. So what I'm going to do is delete that, and I'll delete my volume that I already have, um, and then we will create a new OpenVDB visualize, and it's giving me the same file path. So we'll just see what happens. It probably will crash. It may not. Maybe it won't. Okay, well, no second crash for me tonight. Um, so, let's have a look. If we run that as an IPR, you'll see that we get a lovely bit of smoky smoke. Uh, this is actually a fire, though. It doesn't look like fire at the moment, but it is taking all the density values, uh, essentially, from the render. So, we can just run the... actually and already worth mem uh, mentioning it's already put density float prim var and it's changed that name to density if it was called something else you'd change that name to be whatever else it was um, and for your velocity you'd plug it into your velocity input uh, using a prim var as well now for the emission um, we can make it look like fire if we use a prim var and we find out what it's called because I don't know. So it's called temperature in this one. So we're going to call this temperature. And then we're going to create a PXR ramp again. And I'm going to make this sort of look like fire. Uh, we're going to run the result F into the spline map again. And yeah, we'll just sort of make this look like fire as best as I can in a couple of minutes. All right, so we're going to run the, I've just created this fire ramp. I'm not sure if that's the correct direction, but we'll find out. Uh, we're going to run the Pixar ramp into the emit color. And this is going to give us our emission. So you can see that it's got some flamey flames in there now. Um, obviously, they're not 100% pretty, but it is sort of getting what I want it to do. I think it's actually in reverse. So there you go, it looks a little bit more like fire uh, with very little effort. Now you can obviously make the fire a light source, but obviously anything where you use a mesh as a light source or something like this as a light source, it becomes incredibly noisy. So again, I would use a proxy light and just keep this off. So you can just run the emission um, as and essentially color your flame like that. You could also run the ramp into your diffuse color as well um, if you want to beef it up a little bit I don't know if it made a whole lot of difference there but um, you could blend the two together or you could have a slightly different diffuse color if you want there are options available 
Um, but that is essentially how you render that up. Now, uh, the one thing I haven't gone into yet is uh, anisotropy. Uh, essentially, this is where you're going to be cr uh, controlling uh, anis anisotropic sur uh, surfaces, things like uh, clouds, for example, are uh, going to have uh, densities that are um, varying values depending on which way you're looking at them. Uh, that's basically what anisotropy is in my one second ex uh, one second, second description. Um, there's actually a pretty good description on how to use this and an example on the uh, Renderman wiki page. So I'd recommend going there and checking that out. You can uh, use those same um, example, those same uh, settings uh, for the rabbit cloud and um, then that way you're getting a good, good example of what a, how a cloud could be rendered if you had a cloud open VDB. Um, further down there is only one other option. You've got um, a multi-scatter optimization and obviously again with the um, cloud you'll want to be using multiple scattering so basically what's happening with the cloud is the light's coming in it's being scattered around the cloud um, it works sort of similar to subsurface scattering very similar to subsurface scattering actually um, and then the light ray is shot out towards your eye so you'll see a lot of different colors that are occurring within or different colors and values that are uh, occurring within the cloud itself um, but yeah like i said there is actually a pretty good example on the Rainy man wiki so i would recommend checking that out that's it for this one though. Uh, I think I pretty much covered everything there. Um, I, if you want to learn more about volumes, I will be doing a tutorial. I think they'll probably next week or the week after about how to use uh, do a very similar volume effect in Nuke. Um, so if you're interested, make sure you're subscribed and you will get notified about that when that comes out. Um, otherwise, check out my work, link in the description to my Instagram. Um, and yeah, that's it for now though. Thank you very much for watching and happy rendering.